Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I am Liz Manischel. And I am R. Purcell. This week we welcome producer Bradley Gallo on the show, and he's going to talk about how he got started in filmmaking, how he produced his first feature, and how he's been able to create a sustainable career uh, throughout that time. I've probably watched, you know, maybe 50 to 100 micro-budget films a year just because that's the first uh, director reel I have. He's pretty cool. I like Bradley. Yeah, it was a really uh, fun conversation because it's like this person who just makes feature films for a living and that's what they do. It was really exciting. He Like the day or two days before we talked to him, he announced that he got the rights to the uh, Green Hornet franchise. Yes. So his company is going to make the next Green Hornet big budget movie. They're like the remake from the Seth Rogen one that they did a, f- a few years ago. So that's really exciting. And just, I love his passion. Like I... The, I met him, uh, he moderated a panel that I was on at Napa Valley Film Festival, and he just seemed like the most informed, passionate human. And then I found out afterwards he was a producer. And then I found out afterwards, like, his background as a filmmaker, in addition to being owning his own company, like, just, like, the layers and the passion and the enthusiasm he has for life and art was just very impressive. So I think people will un- will enjoy that aspect as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's jump into the network. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. The New York Times is this great piece about two productions that have gone back to filming and have been filming for days during the pandemic, which I thought was really interesting. They're both not in America, of course. Um, one's in Australia and the other's in um what Iceland yeah Iceland and um, you know it was really interesting they both have different methods and uh, one I think is rep- like you could replicate basically if you had enough money uh, and the other one is seems very like like not like something you could do because like it's all about quarantining the film crew together and it's like it's like the Tyler Perry model yeah and it's like you they, they got lucky because they were already like there making the movies so they were able to quarantine them when it started and you know all these like little circumstances that um allowed them to do it but yeah i don't know the other one the armband system seems really interesting and t- checking temperatures and having these medics and uh you know nurses on set to like monitor people and you know really being diligent about wiping down surfaces and social distancing from each other this week was like a crazy week for the- for news related to COVID filming like i don't know if you've been following but uh, there's also an article posted by The Hollywood Reporter about SAG's new policy, which seems very loose. And um, my hero, Rebecca Green, posted it with uh, on Twitter with the caption, Indie film is dead. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I retweeted it like a maven because I'm obsessed with Rebecca Green. And it got a lot of people really upset. Like I've noticed like there was, there were two camps. There was the camp of taking it personally. Like the idea that filmmakers are upset about not knowing how to proceed during a pandemic somehow made certain individuals feel like those filmmakers didn't care about the safety and health of their community. So there was like that take. And then there was the hot take of like, um, you could just wait for your film. Like you, it's not, it's not life or death that we're in a life. There's like there are all these different extreme reactions, but it does feel like we could be going down a pathway where indie film in America has like a small moratorium. And I don't think that she's wrong. And I, I'm so excited that other countries are getting it together. But yeah, we're not we're not contained in the U.S., so we don't get to go forward. So uh, can you just like kind of you know do a summary of like what the article said and then like what why that leads to rebecca green feeling that uh indie film is no more yeah so the hollywood reporter article basically said that um actors need to seek permission of sag to participate in productions 
And what is uh, the most infuriating part of this is that SAG doesn't lay out the specific standards, rules, practices, or anything like that. It just says those actors need permission. What's frustrating to me, and possibly Rebecca Green, though I don't want to speak for her, is the idea that as lower budget productions want to get going and want to contribute to arts and economy, I feel like we're going to hit a lot of discrimination towards SAG. If there's no rule book, if there's no specific standard, I think it's just going to be discrimination against our budget level. And uh, I think that's crazy. Basically, I'm just nervous. I think everything, all success for indie films, unless you somehow make a Krisha or, you know, like there are outliers, you need to most likely work with SAG talent. And without SAG saying, this is how you work with us, how is a low budget indie production going to get SAG approval? I just don't know how it's going to happen. And so it's the idea that like these smaller indies are not going to be able to get and garner the approval of SAG and therefore won't be able to go forward. We already feel as indie filmmakers that we get a lot of roadblocks from not being having enough money and not being having enough access to filmmakers. But like with this, that there's now a way that we can be blocked for no reason just because we didn't, you know, meet their checklist. That's there's no checklist. It's right, there's like no checklist. checklist. Their thing, gut like subjective reaction. Yeah. Right. So they'll just be like, Oh, you're you're a hundred thousand dollar movie. We we're not gonna let our actor be in this movie because it's not safe. Where if you were like a million dollar movie, they might be like, Oh, no problem. I think that's the fear. And I had um, you know, we're we have an actor we're in negotiations with uh, from before the pandemic. And she contacted me because we're Instagram friends. <laughs> I posted the, I posted the article on Instagram too. And she's like, well, what does this mean for lady parts? And I was like, you know what? I don't know. We're going to abide by SAG standards, SAG AFTRA standards, no matter what. So we're just nervous and we're going to do whatever they want us to do, but we don't know what they want us to do. And she said, call up SAG ask them. So we did. We called up SAG and we said, hey, SAG, what can we do? What are you know, what are the specific rules that you want us to follow? How can we greenlight our production in the age of COVID-19? And they're like, we don't know. We don't have any information for you. We'll let you know soon. Oh, OK. Wow. So they just were like, we don't have any info. We'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah. After they made this big statement about what they're going to do. And then they're like, oh, we don't really know. We'll get back to you. Well, the statement itself is vague, but I think it's just like, Yet again, as indie filmmakers, I don't want to No, none of us want to put people at risk. None of us want to go forward with an unsafe production. And I think that should be clear, but maybe it's not. We're not I don't wouldn't say we're, you know, indie filmmakers are frustrated because we just want to make our dangerous movies and, you know, put our passion projects into life. It's like we're frustrated because we don't know how to abide by standards and continue to like hire people and cast people and provide opportunities and jobs like we're just waiting and i think that's going to build up a lot of frustration and tension and we'll continue to do so yeah the thing that makes me the most nervous is the idea that you have to have like all this extra like staff on set to make sure this the set is safe and i just i can't imagine like on on the indie budgets i work on e even for corporate video that we would be able to do that, you know? Like, it's just, <laughs> I can't imagine, like, adding a nurse and an, a medic to every set, you know, that if if we're talking, like, a four- or five-person crew or even a 20-person crew, it's like, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of extra added time and a lot of extra added budget, which I maybe mean, that's just what we have to get used to. I don't know. I, I think one of the things that I'm excited about is the fact that you're making a movie right now and you are <laughs> in this process. And so we'll get to learn uh, as you learn, as you figure out what's going on. And I'm just an optimist. And so I, I see <laughs> this. I don't just jump to like the worst case scenario. I just say, oh, they're they're trying to figure it out. They're like, you know taking steps. So I read that article and I was just like, okay, whatever. Um, but I didn't like look at it as like some like doom and gloom, like terrible thing because they didn't have a really clear thought out um, plan yet. Cause I'm sure they will when they do. And, and when they do have a, a, a plan and a, a system to follow, then that's when we'll really know what, what it means for us. I think. I just think I'd be a happier person in life if I had your attitude uh, and I wish I was born with it and I've just not and all I could think of are the doom and gloom scenarios and like the ways that all of us are going to be essentially delayed in our career for like two years and I'm thinking like what does that mean and I think like I know it sounds weird but I have all these obsessions about age and being a woman and like yeah. being appealing and all these things that 
get wrapped up into the industry and that uh, that is part of being a prolific filmmaker. And you can't be prolific if you're not allowed to produce. Like what I'm trying to convince my team over here to do as a backup plan, we have a production meeting in a few hours, is like, what would it be if we shot a film in singles? Like this guy, um, I think he was a Google employee. He suggested a way to like composite actors and composite shadows and like try to figure out a safe way to use technology to make a movie right now. But it's like, what if we did just shoot it in singles and we did... We shot listed in a way where no one was closer than six feet together. I mean, the problem is we have a sex scene in our movie, so I have no right. idea how we're going to do that. Um, but if you're working with people who are all sheltering in place together and you are, you know, checking temperature and, and abiding by safety protocols that you all agree to. And if there's a way that we don't have people sit next to each other on set and like shoot them in like, yeah, in singles and wides where they're farther away and there's a reason that they're farther away from each other like there may be a way to shoot one now if you can think that you're the only people who are going to get really close to each other are the actors because they have to like be in a sex scene together couldn't you just get those two actors tested and make sure that they're clean and safe ready to go and then just abide by all those protocols and you should be good right yeah as long as sag approves and so it's like do you build up like a big presentation to sag and the actors that you're working with and just say Trust me, you know, like you're, you're the, you know, bring a rep to our set and watch what we're doing. You know, it's like, what are the hoops? But uh, this is, again, me, uh, you know, spinning into my questions. And you're right. There are no answers right now. So it's just waiting and seeing. Uh, is there any update on casting? Like, have you gotten any answers from anybody at all? Or is it still like no one's giving you any answers because of SAG? We posted a breakdown on like Actors Access and like the basic LA casting networks because we thought A, it'll help with momentum for us, B, it'll get the attention of managers and agents, and C, because you know, we may end up actually just holding auditions or some you know, having people submit tape. We got a lot of attention. I've gotten so oh. many messages from <laughs> actors oh, from I bet. Facebook friend requests, <laughs> Instagram friend I mean like a, a lot of emails and a lot of comments. So, and this is across the board. Our casting director's getting a lot of contact. You know, our producer, Devin's getting a lot. So there are actors there who want to work. There are tons of actors who want to work right now. Uh, I wish that they also could decide what projects they wanted to be a part of and not have to, you know, have this vague submission to SAG situation, but whatever. And so everyone's asking us, how are you going to do it? And so we're also... We'd like to have answers for them, too. Right. You're trying to figure out, like, what system you're going to go with. Like, if you're going to do this armband thing that these guys in Iceland did or there's because there's a lot of, like, documentation that's coming out now, right? Like, about rules you should follow if you're going to make a movie or whatever. So is that part of what your production meeting's about? Like, trying to figure out what your system's going to be? Well, I also think that and then also insurance. Like, oh, geez, will there yeah. be an insurance insurer that says, yeah, that's fine. We'll insure your production <laughs> in the yeah. midst of a pandemic. So we're also talking to like uh, production services companies where we would maybe work with their equipment and their crew in exchange for their insurance. Like maybe there's a way where we can build up a team through trust and through protocol so that we can convince all the stakeholders that we want you know, that we can go forward. Right. I mean, that's basically what we did for the alternate. We we partnered with a production company that had insurance and we just did it through them, which yeah. isn't really what you're supposed to do, but um, but it worked. I think this is different than that, is working with a company who provides production services versus doing a co-production with someone. But I mean, but what you described, everyone does. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think the way that you're talking about it, it you you go through this other production company, they would, uh, you know, set up insurance for your film specifically through their company. Um, I believe so. Because they have like access to the equipment and then they can like ensure that everything is going to be clean and safe. And, you know, we're not bringing a camera from here, this random person, a light from this random person. And, you know, mixing everything up so it's all extra contaminated, which is what I do on all my productions or used to do on my productions. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. gather gear from wherever you can get it for as cheap as you can get it, where yeah. that's not going to really be as favorable anymore, unfortunately, which is too bad. I think this is going to all ease up. It might take a year. It might take longer. 
might be six months, who knows, but I think the world's not ever going to be exactly the same, but we're going to be able to get back to doing things the way we did at some point. I want to eat whatever you eat for breakfast. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so Liz, guess what? What? You've got mail. <laughs> Breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You got mail. This is a longtime listener, John Flipko. Hey, Ulrich and Liz. I've been listening for a long time, and I want to thank both uh, you both and Tim for keeping me involved in filmmaking, even during the times where my day job forces filmmaking to backseat it for a while. I want to ask you your take on the benefits of making comedy sketches as it relates to growing your filmmaking muscles and potentially gaining recognition and advancing your career. Uh, the extent of my filmmaking is working on my own and a couple other YouTube channels that predominantly make comedy sketches. Game off! Ours is a step above novice stuff. For example, we do actual use actual equipment, reds, black magic, sound and lights, red cameras for those who don't know the, the short term, hiring actors uh, when we can. However... Uh, after making a lot of these and realizing it does not really advance my career, I am thinking it is more just something to do for fun. We have had some videos that gets tens of thousands of views and some that get only hundreds. I've made like 30 to 40, but people, but beyond it being fun and great experience with acting, directing, technical, and editing, I feel it may be time to move on and shoot a short. One benefit of being viral or becoming some kind of influencer would be that you could potentially gain a massive social media following. I haven't. But I know that industry folk definitely like to see and bring people onto their projects who have a lot of followers for free advertising. Thanks so much for what you do. You've kept me motivated for years now. John Philip Co. YouTube, uh, Philip Co. Video, and Four Tall Guys at John Philip Co. I live in LA and my day job is property management. Well, thanks for the email, John. That's awesome. And they'll try to answer your question as best as we can. Liz, what are your thoughts on all this? I immediately am thinking, why are you making another short? Like you spend all this time making these awesome shorts and putting them out into the world. Why aren't you seeing those as shorts? And why not do a longer form project? He already said that they were very professionally done. And he's definitely got a lot of experience working and uh, working his his craft muscles, <laughs> so to speak. So I just keep thinking, why is he short changing himself? Get it? And why doesn't he do something a little bit bigger, a little bit grander? But that's always my argument for people who ask me if they should make a short. If these shorts are purely just sketches and they don't really have a lot of like filmmaking, like, you know, things to them, like, like a full story or lots of different locations, cinematic camera moves and cinematic angles and cinematic storytelling. If they're devoid of those things and it's really just like SNL type sketches that aren't the cinematic t variety, um, then I can sort of see like why he'd want to do a narrative short, you know, and sort of, uh, you know, get that muscle going because it is very different than like shooting a sketch with like improv or comedians, right? Like that's, I don't know. I haven't really done a ton of that, but I just know that it's a, it's a sort of a different beast. So I guess it kind of depends on like what his goals are. Like, does he want to be a comedy movie director um, or a comedy filmmaker? Because if he does, then the sketches are perfect. And then yes, just launch into your bigger, longer form project from this. But if you want to be like, you know, a artsy, dramatic, like filmmaker or a horror filmmaker or some other brand of filmmaking that you haven't done anything of, then maybe making a short uh, of that variety or that genre would make sense. But I'm kind of more with you, Liz. Like if you've had, if you've made 40, what do you say? 30 to 40 videos? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's time to make a feature, but I, I don't know. I think, t you know, the question I always ask people is, is like, what is your goal? Like, what is the thing that you want to accomplish? Like, do you want to make a feature film? Is that the goal? Because if that's the goal, you could probably just do that now. <laughs> you don't really need to wait for right. anybody else. But if your goal is to like, I don't know, become like a TV writer or something or get in a writer's room, I don't know if, if that's more of the goal than, I don't know, that maybe that isn't the right thing to do. But I just think it depends on like what you're trying to get after. You have a lot of a lot more of a measured response than I do. I just feel like <laughs> so many people are like they use the short and this is not anyone I'm, you know, I don't think you did this, Ulrich. I don't think a lot of people <laughs> that our friends might have done this, but I do know a lot of people who use shorts to avoid 
going into scarier things. Right. And so I always take that with me when I answer that question. And then also, I just remember before making my first feature, the things that I was most scared of were the technical aspects. Because, like, you know how to tell a story. You've made more than, I'm sure, 30 to 40 projects are not the only projects this guy has done. I'm sure he's written short stories. I'm sure he's told stories right. in person. You know, like, he knows how to tell a story. So it's just the question of, like, does he have enough meat to say a longer form um, thesis, which is what a feature usually has, right? It's like a really long essay on film. And so you have to have like some actual substance to what you're trying to say and communicate to the world. And that's the concern. Does he have a topic or a script that's uh, enough to get you through 90 right. minutes? I think that's the, the, you know, the big thing, you know, and, and, and I think that's sort of what stops a lot of people from making their longer form content is like, they don't have the script they believe in, you know, and they don't find that thing that like they're obsessed over. And then they, they really want to dedicate three to four years or more to, I, I used to think before making the alternate that it was like, Oh, you know, I'll, uh, you know, do this movie and then whatever comes next, I'll just direct the next thing I get a chance to direct. Like, yeah, you know, whatever comes my way, I, I want to just keep going. And then after doing it and how hard it was to make that movie, I really like kind of double back on the idea that like, yes, no, like it, it really needs to be an important movie that means something t to me in order to, to go and do that because it's just not worth it. It's just too hard. It's too much work. It's too stressful. It's too it's just too much to do if you don't believe in it. So like, you really got to find the thing that you believe in. So it's like, that's the next question. Like, do you have a story or a script that you believe in enough to like commit yourself to, you know, I don't know if this is true, John, and I don't know if this is part of what you're saying, but it kind of feels like he wants to get, be a part of a bigger project, you know, and somehow get like into something with a bigger company because, you know, he references like, oh, oh right, you know, social media thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, maybe like industry folk will like to see people like bring people on a project that have followers, blah, blah, blah. But I think the important thing to, to say to John and to all indie filmmakers who are up and coming is that no one's going to come and like, you know, <laughs> like you're not going to make like like a video that's like gets a million views on YouTube. And then suddenly you're going to get handpicked by a producer and you're going to go off to direct a movie. Like that doesn't really, I mean, that happens like one in a trillion, basically, <laughs> like people that happens to, right? Like it doesn't, you really have to just do it yourself. So I think you should just like think more about like, where are you going to get the budget to make your movie? Like what kind of movie do you want to make? And really get into like the idea of being a producer of your own content, like doing what you're doing with the, with the short stuff, but like on a longer, bigger scale because no one's going to come and do it for you. Like no one's just going to say like, Oh, you've made all these short films or these sketches or, or even if you make this like one amazing short film, like the chances that you're going to be the uh, Jim Cummings or the whiplash, the whiplashes of the world. Like sure. it's just such a, such a small chance that that'll happen to you and with your film. So you really should just be thinking about like, what do you need to do to get the feature made? And is a short important for that? Because, and I would argue, probably not. The pandemic has uh, emphasized this point for me uh, with like a capital, a capital T and an exclamation point. But think about time and what your time is worth. Um, I find that uh, ever since I had a kid and doubled up with a pandemic, that time is at an absolute premium right now. So look at the duration of time it takes for you to make a short film or a um, feature and think about the repercussions, the possible the possible benefits to both, and think about how long it takes for you to make a sketch. Like, really do the math of, like, what your time is worth and what your goals are, just like you were saying, Ulrich. And I just think, uh, yes, I'm the I'm the pessimist, but, like, we are all going to die. Uh, if Lynn <laughs> Shelton, like, this whole Lynn Shelton thing has spun me out, by the way. Oh, no, um, yeah. But, like, you think about your projects, think about what you want to do and do what you love and do what you love now. And it sounds like if you're even flirting with the idea of doing a short and that's what's pulling you, then we say, make that fucking short, John. Do it. It's going to be amazing. But don't sell yourself short. If you really want to do something else, please do it and let us know how it goes. Yeah, we would love to hear how, how this goes and if this advice was helpful. <laughs> yeah, so sorry to get so dark. But like, really, this Lynn Shelton thing is like, what? Yeah. What? 
Um, but we don't Life have to go into precious. it. I know it's crazy. And uh, yeah, it's it's especially right now when people are just dying. It's uh, it's it's tough, man. And it's not just old people. <laughs> I know. I'm it's sorry that you there's no safe segue sick. out of this. There's like you can't <laughs> like we can't jump to our like Patreon page call out right now. I don't think. Right. Can no, we? I just no. think it's like it's just yeah, I think that's a really important thing. Like what what is important to you in your time? And like what are you going to put your time into? And like yeah, I, I mean filmmaking isn't life or death like we were saying earlier. Like it's right. not like the most important thing in the world, you know. Um but like if you are going to make a movie like you should be making something that is that important to you because it is going to, you are going to, you know, no matter if you know it or not, you're going to make sacrifices for your movie and you just make sure it's worth it. You know? Yeah. Anyways, the call Liz, <laughs> the call. Yeah. And also shout out because the call <laughs> was made by our guest, Bradley Gallo. He produced what, what? that film. So thank you, Bradley, for making this movie that we can use for our topic. You've got the best team of people in this whole city working to find you. But in order for us to help you, I need you to help me. But we have a new patron this week. That's um, amazing. And I, I don't know this person. Week. Do you know this person? I know this person. They're going to be on the show, which is hopefully, we'll see. But right now they're scheduled. Robin Kincaid, thank you so much for the generous uh, donation. We, we really appreciate it. This is actually a really fun story. Robin hired me 10 years ago as a PA on The Amazing Race in San Francisco. Sometime in, in March or April, she sent me an email and she's like, oh, I love your podcast. You probably don't remember me, but... I hired you 10 years ago on this production in San Francisco, The Amazing Race. And I was like, oh, my God. Real, oh, wow. I, of course I remember. That was like a big job for me at the time. You know, it was like get, be, on this huge show, season finale sort of thing. Um, but they hired like 100 production assistants for that job. And the fact that she even remembered me out of 100 PAs across like a week. Of course I, she did. I was like, wow, crazy. But anyways, thanks, Robin. And thanks for the kind words on the show. And thank you very much for the donation. Thank you, Robin. If you want to be like Robin and you want to support the show, you can go to www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. And you can check out our page. Um, our enamel pins have not arrived yet. Um, <laughs> but when they do, there will be a picture of them on there. And that'll be the newest, biggest thing. And kind of the only really important thing we've ever done on the Patreon page. But, uh, but yeah, I'm really excited for that. And thank you all to all the patrons who have continued to support us through these tough and uncertain times. You can also send us iTunes reviews, which are really, really lovely. And we've gotten a couple new ones recently, which has been fantastic. Thank you all. Amazing. So now we're on to Soap Dish. I'm Lori Craven, and I'm an actress. <laughs> an actress? Really? How nice for you. I'm Betsy Faye Sharon, and I'm a bitch. Tell us, what is impact distribution and why do I care about it? <laughs> so it's what I do for a living. I work at, as an impact distribution agency. That's why you should care. Uh, no, what you should care is because it's a whole subset of, of distribution that a lot of fiction filmmakers don't pay attention to. And a lot of documentarians um, make movies specifically to distribute in an impactful way. And so um, impact distribution is when you are distributing content out into the world and you're doing it with an intention and a practice to change the world, if that makes mm, sense, to make policy right. change, to make culture change, to make societal change, whatever it is. And so what certain impact producers or impact agencies do, they systematize screenings in what we call the semi-theatrical space. Ooh, sexy, semi-theatrical. Uh, <laughs> and, and they encourage and enforce those call to actions or calls to action to take place um, at those screenings, at those convenings. Semi-theatrical is like anywhere that's not a movie theater. It's like community centers, colleges, universities. It's uh, a live yes. screening. And so impact distribution is now pivoted and there's lots of virtual screenings. So there'll be, let's say there's a screening of a conservation documentary and mm. they give out bamboo straws at the screening and they also ask everyone to sign a petition to their congressperson in the room uh, to ban the use of single-use plastic. Like, that is an impactful screening. 
And right. this is what a lot of documentarians have been doing. But fiction filmmakers can work in this world where if they have a, you know, like a film with a target audience or a specific uh, intention to impact their audience, they could do the same thing. So, um, for my film about uh, a person who discovers uh, an alternate dimension and then abuses that discovery, sure. uh, is there something that I could do that's impactful for that, or is it just like you know, because I'm making a sci-fi genre film, like this doesn't apply to me? Sometimes the context of the film can be a part of the impact distribution. So I worked for David Zeiger and he made this movie, Sweet Old World, he talks about it on the podcast, and he made it in an effort to kind of, um, in part, uh, use art to deal with uh, the death of his son. And what we did when I came on board is we pitched grief therapists. We, uh, we pitched the film for grief therapists to use and watch in their meetings and their conferences so that they could understand a personal experience that their clients may be having. Like, it was all to be used as a tool for them. So right. it was a fiction film. The film actually doesn't often directly deal with the subject matter, but David himself, the filmmaker, used it in, in impact screenings. So there is a way for you to use your sci-fi film if possible you are using it as a therapeutic exercise if you are donating proceeds to a nonprofit or organization like there's a way to kind of fold yourself in there right right yeah I'd have to think about what it was what it is because I mean the, the movie is uh, at its core about entitlement right so but I don't really know if there's like any entitlement self-help groups out there or anything or like any like communities you could just pitch a semi-theatrical run, too, or an educational run where you go and you talk about how you made the movie or you go and you talk about entitlement. Why not? The world is your oyster, Ulrich. Right. I mean, I think for a genre filmmaker, it'd be probably more about like trying to target um, genre fans. Right. So like if you didn't like get into a bunch of genre film festivals, because that's like probably where you're going to have the most impact with your audience is that one of these places where your fans congregate, you know, like mm -hmm. that's where they all go to to see the new genre things or just to eat up anything they can get genre wise that they're not going to necessarily see on Netflix or, you know, in the theater. But yeah, I wonder like if there's a thing that you could do, like kind of similar to um, these road shows that people do where you take your movie out to different, you know, venues and like show it off and, and sort of make it about the, the genre-ness of it and like why this movie is important to be seen within the, you know, your genre and then that conversation of the genre. Well, we interviewed Naomi McDougal Jones, right, a few months ago. Right, right. And yeah. she, I mean, those were theatrical events but she booked her own theatrical events and then she paired it with that vampire joyful vampire ball afterwards and right. hers is a genre film and also she pitched it as a way to it was inclusivity it was like do you feel like an outsider do you feel like you don't fit in come dress up be a part of this community and be a, you know so it, i think that's a tough sell for sci-fi maybe but i think there's there's got to be a way in there's i'm her horror film works well for that, but maybe there's um, an economic inequality aspect that you can talk about with your film in relation to yeah, right. like entitlement. I'm just hoping that uh, I can get a good enough deal in, I would say, more of the traditional markets where it's like uh, a movie like this would thrive, you know, mm -hmm. and then these impact screenings would be less important. But I don't know. Maybe maybe I should be more open minded and be thinking about this no matter what the situation. But impact distribution usually happens around the time of festivals before it's exploited on like oh, a consumer platform. So it's a little bit early. It's kind of like educational, like how educational comes before it's available on something like iTunes. Like these are little windows you can exploit uh, because you're you're exclusive. You're exclusive to that that platform. You're exclusive. And then sometimes, you know, if you're already on iTunes, you pitch it as like you can have me too. You can have uh, me coming. Uh, via a, a Zoom webcast right. to your location, and um, we can chat and do a Q&A that way. So the the impact thing, are you charging tickets to these screenings? Is the idea that these are going to be profitable for the movie, that you like rent out a venue for not so much money, and then you get like a bunch of people to come there and, and, re and buy tickets? Or is it more about spreading the message of the film? 
The way, well, it depends on what you want. So you, we always ask, like, our client, we're like, what, you know, do you want it to be a licensed screening tour with license fees or do you want it to be, you know, free? And a lot of people who push impact first will say, I want it to be free. I want it to be widely available. But it's actually up to the host. So the idea is, like, you're pitching the film to a, we call it smiling and dialing, but you have, like, a long list of community centers, nonprofits, colleges, universities, film festivals, all these people that you are pitching to. And then they get to decide how they're going to use the film at their venue. So it's not really about making money. It's more about just getting the movie out there and getting it seen by people. Well, but if you choose a a paid, you know, a licensed screening tour, then that host needs to pay you, you know, some anywhere from like 50 to like $400 uh, for for the opportunity to screen your film. And then they could charge tickets if they want to, and they could use it as a fundraiser as they want to. It's all like negotiated. Right, right, right. But it's not like meant to be a big moneymaker necessarily. It is. It is for documentary filmmakers. Like if you have, um, you know, if you have content that's not available anywhere else, this is a way that filmmakers are making money. But if you're saying it's a $400 fee per screening, like how many screenings do you have to have before it actually like makes a big difference on your budget? Well, it depends on what your time is worth, because if you're just, you know, there's no hard costs other than like shipping out the DVD, but you could charge them. You could make them pay for the shipping costs. But it's like what how much is your time worth of like outreach, emails, convert, you know, locking down that screening, figuring out the logistics, getting them the materials like that's that's the offset. That's like what um, you're evaluating when you're deciding whether you do this or not. But think about it, like theatrical, people are not necessarily profiting from their theatrical run. And this is a way where you get paid instead of doing like a rev share, you get paid a license fee. So how many, like, let's say like one of your your clients, like how many of these impact screenings are they doing uh, for their films? Is it like 10, five, a hundred? I can tell you that I worked on The Cave, which was nominated for an Academy Award. It was a free license. It was a free screening tour. Like, it was not licensed. And we did 131 screenings over just a few months. Um, I can tell you that we worked on a film. uh, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say, but we worked on a very well known documentary. And it did. I think over 300 screenings in just a few months. And they weren't collecting fees for this. This was just to get it out there. Or? Those were free, but there have been instances of paid screening tours that have hit hundreds of screenings as well. Okay, because that that is like you know some real money there if you yeah, you know exactly. if you have over a hundred. But it, it does sound like it's more of a of a tool that's better fitted for like a documentary though. Well, just because of the target audience, like you could pair yourself with a nonprofit who has the same goals as your film has, where, you know, right. if you make a fiction film about sexual health, that's, you know, that's an opportunity for you. But if you make like an indie dramedy, which is, you know, like a relationship piece, I think it'll be tough to find a partner there. It just has to be the right thing. Like um, our previous guest, uh, Niesa Hardiman's film, Sea Fever, Fever, which is, it's like a, you know, a sci-fi thriller uh, but it's also like it got a message about exploration and how to treat like an unknown species. And then also it talks about like, you know, science versus people's own desires, basically. Like what's the better like the, for the greater good of humanity um, or the greater good of these 10 people, you know, like what's mm. more important? And so I don't know. I could d- definitely see like some impact screenings being developed around that movie. But Liz, what do we have for our players of the week? What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? I found two of my close friends and I asked them, what do you bring to set emotionally and physically? And I wanted to specifically intro the first one because she didn't slate. And this is my best friend and she didn't slate. (laughs) So we're starting off with Ali Sher, writer, director. And then we'll cap it off with my friend Jill, who works in our department. Well, I always bring my back pillow because director's chairs are horribly uncomfortable. I always bring my binder, which always has my shot lists and my um, storyboards and notes and important things that I need for the day. I always bring my backpack and it's usually stuffed with snacks um, that are easy to to deal with and and don't necessitate me going over to craft services if I might not have time. Comfortable shoes. I mean, I wear them to set. I don't know. That's not really something I bring. I think that's it. I think those are the main staples of my 
my set bag. Hi, my name is Jill and I'm an art department coordinator. I work in the art department mainly on major studio films, so that means I'm in the office more than I'm on set. I'm required to provide all my own equipment, so my hardware, my software, including my computer, my monitors, my hard drives, my design software, including my Adobe Creative Cloud subscription, my drafting programs, and any software I might need for the office management portion of the job, including Microsoft Office. I also find it's helpful to have a stash of supplies with me because oftentimes we'll open an office and not know if our film is going to get greenlit or how long we'll be there and we won't have a cash flow yet. So anything I can provide to help get us started really makes things easier and that includes our specialty art items like our paper, our inks, our art supplies and the mundane items like paper clips, binders, pens, post-its. Anything that someone might need immediately makes their lives easier, which by proxy makes my life easier. So I carry five to six boxes with me from show to show, just so we have it on hand if we need it. Um, personally, I like to have a few things with me, like little lights or items that people have given me from other shows, just little desk comforts to sort of brighten my space and make it more creative. Um, like I said, I'm in the office a lot. So anything that I can do in that respect, like have little graphics out or research or photos that really inspire my space to be more creative really helps. Awesome. Well, thanks, Liz, and thanks to uh, our two players of the week. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all you people who have given the time to you know lend your voice to the podcast i i really think it's been a fun addition to the show to hear from people i really like it it's kind of like one of my favorite parts of the show but i mean that makes sense because i don't want to listen to myself um, <laughs> anyways without further ado let's get to bradley Well, uh, Bradley, welcome to the show. Um, the first thing we're going to do uh, is give you a little rapid fire questions like uh, about your career as a producer. So I'll go first. What was your shortest shoot and what was your longest shoot? My shortest shoot and probably for everybody is my first film. My first film, I think I shot in 12 days and it was a $150,000 budget Shot it in New Hampshire, had no idea how to make a movie, didn't go to film school, grassroots, pro produced it, directed it, started it, wrote it. Um, back in the days when they had those, uh, you know, everybody was eating the Edward Burns, making those Sundancey films and doing the best you could. But uh, that was it. That was my shortest. My longest shoot is probably upcoming because we just got the rights to Green Hornet. And we're extremely excited about making the big budget uh, studio film of which I think will have will be my longest shoot because almost every other shoot I've done has been somewhere between 25 and 33 days. And even the ones that were 33 days, I probably brought them down to 28. You know what I mean? Like by the time we were wow. actually in production. So that's where I usually wow. live. Well, congrats on Green Hornet. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, you're breaking news here on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bradley, we're going to kick the speed a little bit. So uh, budgets, small, smallest budget, largest budget. Smallest budget was also the $150,000 first film. But uh, my most recent smallest budget was Them That Follow, $1.3 million. And the largest budget will be Green Hornet, which will probably be north of $100 million. Um, but wow. currently produced... The, the larger budget was probably around 15. What's the project you've worked on the longest? The project I've worked on the longest, um, all of these budgets, uh, sorry, all of these movies end up being around three or four years, but I would say The Call because today we're still dealing with The Call in a good way. We're collecting checks. And so since nice. the, uh, the movie keeps involving accounting and, and all kinds of backroom stuff and we're thinking about sequels, that's the longest. All right. And what has been the most difficult? The most difficult? Um, you know, I would say the smaller the budget, the, more, the most difficult because you're trying to do so much. And this movie, The Road Within, and, and the movie, Them That Follow, were uh, difficult productions because you're trying to do so much and so little. But, um, you know, I haven't really had much of a difficulty. Once we get a movie going... We're pretty good about it, and I'm pretty kind of, I don't know what the word is, but I'm, I'm an even keel kind of guy, so 
uh, I don't, I, nothing's been such a disaster, if that makes sense. It does. And I was just thinking back about how we met and you uh, moderated a panel at Napa Valley Film Festival and you were just like, you seem so calm and um, informed and powerful. And you, and then we met later for drinks and you're talking about how you really want to support indie content um, mainly as a producer, but it seems like as a mentor to filmmakers. Can you talk a little bit about your interest in the indie world? I love the indie world. And, and, and I'm saying that having just acquired, you know, uh, and be uh, attached to produce a studio movie. But I have lived for 20 years in the indie world. And there's something very special about the family-esque way of making movies where everybody has their core job. They're all doing their best. A lot of times... It's their first time doing that position, whether it's a costume designer and they were, you know, coming up from being, you know, a costumer and now uh, or, you know, a production designer that came up from being an art director. I, I just love being um, giving people their shot and then also at the same time helping mentor them through that process. And I find that the projects come out to be creatively the best for the tools that we're all given and we become best of friends and want to work with them again. And I think the better filmmakers are the ones that keep their same quality groups together that they've worked with so that they know the shorthand because movies are tough and, and long and expensive and, and you, you need a camaraderie like that. So I hope that answers your question. I'm going to jump around here a little bit. Going back to starting out as a producer, like how did you find like your first project? Like what was it that brought you to produce your first film? Well, filmmaking in general and the process of the movies was always a big fascination of mine because if you go back to elementary school and you look at my yearbook, you say he wanted to be an actor. I think almost anybody in this business wanted to be an actor first. We just didn't know any better. We just thought that was what we wanted. Um, but in terms of like getting to the first level of film, I think it started to itch back up again in college. And I was pr planning to be a veterinarian. I had done everything. Uh, I went to for pre-vet school. I was doing everything I could to become a veterinarian. I was working and picking up poop around veterinarian hospitals and so what you would consider internships. And, uh, and, and, I, and I had this bug going and going. So I just started writing. I was writing screenplays. I wasn't very good at it. Um, I eventually wrote this screenplay called Magic Rock. And uh, I said, how am I going to make this happen? And I had a lot of energy when you're in your 20s. And I just went out and raised the money from doctors and lawyers and family members and put this kind of film together. And, and I knew this summer camp up in, I was going to write about a summer camp. And I knew that this camp existed in New Hampshire. And I knew the owners and I can work a deal. And, you know, you could house the crew, feed the crew and shoot the entire movie in this one location. Uh, that was the kind of thinking then, and it, it really sparked off my love of everything by doing every single piece. I wrote it, I directed it, I produced it, I acted in it, and then I realized slowly that I was kind of best as a producer, where you touch a little bit of everything, organize it, you're kind of the head camp counselor, and you're, and you're leading everybody towards this amazing creative goal that a director's vision or a writer's vision needs to take place. Wait, was the veterinary love, was that because you just hadn't found film yet? Or is that like still this unfulfilled? It's one of the of best yours? questions I've ever been asked. And it leads <laughs> right into the film business, but I didn't even know it. So at the time, I, I had an obsession with James Herriot, James, I don't even know if I'm saying his name, James Herriot books. And they were all this veterinarian who would write stories. And I think that they were coming from his true life, but he wrote them in sort of a fictional way. And I fell in love with like all, all things great and small and these, and I just thought it was about being a veterinarian. So I was like, oh, I must want to be a veterinarian. These are amazing books and the stories and they take me to these weird worlds in the middle of the country that I've never seen growing up in New York. And, uh, and so I started pursuing to be a vet. And then later I realized I couldn't put dogs to sleep. I couldn't deal with pain. I couldn't deal with a lot of what a veterinarian would need, the science, the calculus. I was terrible at calculus, like anything that related to making yourself become a vet, I knew I was not going to succeed. And the medical schools, the veterinarian medical schools, are even harder than the regular medical schools because instead of knowing just the human body, male or female, you had to know all the species. So I was like out pretty early and then realized it was storytelling that was attracting me and it wasn't about the vet. <laughs> What really strikes me as interesting about this is that, you know, you were going your way to be a vet, then you were a production assistant on, on two films in the year 2000. Right. And then you immediately make your first feature where the one that you described, Magic Rock, where you do all these things. Why did you decide to just jump from, you know, zero to 60 that way and just like go out and raise the money and make this feature? 
Well, let, let, me just, let me just make it very clear that Magic Rock is a terrible film. But there's no way that I would have known that, right? <laughs> uh, unless I tried. I hope you never find it. Um, no, I mean, I don't know what happened in that exact moment, but I felt in college um, that I had this sort of bravado. I, you know, people call it ego. I felt like it was confidence. And I just, I, I was watching so many movies. I was, I was in, indulging in so much creative like thinking, and I was taking a, a, at the senior year in high school, I was taking a creative writing class, and the teacher was very encouraging and was really pushing me to write these short stories, and I just, I can feel the spark, and, and I just didn't know what it was, so I just kept pursuing, kept pursuing. And then, of course, when you come out of college, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, and it doesn't happen, and you're like, well, I guess I'm going to be a production assistant. And I had this friend of a friend of a friend who knew this set and knew this guy who was going to be able to hire a production assistant, so I got on to Keeping the Faith, um, and then I got on to Autumn in New York, and I was not liking the production assistant thing. Standing around, holding perimeters, <laughs> miserable. You don't know where it's going to lead, but I was doing these production assistant jobs. I was, not, um, I was not really sure what I wanted to do from the big standpoint of like how, how that leads to anything. And I met a 30-year-old production assistant on that set, and he was talking about a script that he wanted to do. And I was thinking to myself at 21, I cannot be a production assistant at 30. I'm not doing that. So that's where it kind of sparked in like, how do I make this happen? And that was when the whole Sundance, Edward Burns things happened. Like, well, you just write a script and you just go and raise money and you just go to the festival and all of a sudden you become famous. And like you get that kind of drive and you're reading every book, every single how-to filmmaker book, I read it. And I was reading how to write screenplays. Like there's one called The Screenwriter's Bible by John Trottier. I never forget it. That was the book I bought and just started writing from. They had something called the Hollywood Creative Directory back then. It was a thick book of like 200 production companies and distribution companies with all their phone numbers and everything you could possibly do. And I would call every single one of them, take trips to LA, force myself into rooms and had no idea what I was doing. And of course, nobody's going to do magic rock. So, you know, I had to, uh, I had to go back to the well of just doctors, lawyers and family members and yeah, you, know, you have a significant. It was like I was on drugs, and I've never done a drug in my life. There was like a significant amount of energy and power and passion that comes. And if you don't have that young, forget it, because you lose it over time, and you have to kind of like ignite it as you're older. And uh, <laughs> and I would say that's uh, not an easy thing when you've never done a drug in your life. I have a similar question. I mean, the idea of zero to sixty, you. You produce, you produce individual projects, but now you've built a foundation, you've built a company. How can you talk a little about that process of aggregating enough projects where you can actually be liquid and have your own company? Yeah, your own company is is one of the toughest parts of the business if you're going to run your own production company. Um, and what that entails for us is that we have a very lean and mean company. So you have an accountant, we have a development exec, a production executive, and then there's me and Michael. Uh, we also now, later, as we expanded, expanded into television, so we have a head of television, right? But what we do is scripts come in, they come from friends, they come from, uh, you know, agencies, they come from filmmaker relationships, actor relationships. I get, you know, I get a script from an actor that I'm working on a movie with all the time, that kind of stuff. And they, they get filtered through the development process where our development execs have their teams of interns and or um, assistants, and they will read them, then it goes elevated to the head of development and then he or she reads and then there's coverage made and then it becomes like okay these are the two scripts this weekend you have to read and then I am going home and reading those two scripts and then calling up my team and saying why I like it or why I don't like it and what's the problem and usually it entails a bunch of other things other than the script itself being great what's the budget what are the far I mean we can talk for hours about this stuff who's the cast Who's the director? What's the, what's the direction? Where are they going to shoot it? How, you know, there's so much to think about. And does that work for our company? And can we can we spend the time on a movie that's made for a million dollars? We're going to have no no producer fee when I got to cover overhead in the company. Does that make sense? So there's this bit process that we go through till it gets elevated, and I can answer questions about that process. Are you personally reading two scripts every weekend in addition to your team? I would say I'm reading about two scripts a week. Um, wow. I wouldn't say a weekend. Okay. And, and that's because it's getting elevated up there. And there are times where I read 30 pages in and I'm like, this isn't going to work for me. There are times where the staff says it doesn't work, don't even bother, even though it's a friend of mine, right? Because I don't have right. time. Right, I really right, right. 
And then there are times where it gets to me and I love it. And then I get into the details and I'm like, oh, no, 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 that pass. Or I, I love it and I love it. And then I keep going and now I'm losing it. The moment I love it, I love it. It turns out that there's like three other companies loving it too. And I end up losing it. And that's a whole other process, losing it in negotiations. And I can tell you a great story about Shirley one day. Uh, this project that's coming out by Josephine Decker that I lost in a negotiation. Like, let's say you read one of these scripts, you love it, love it, love it. Talk to us about the process from that moment. Like, what do you do? What happens next? So I love it, love it, love it. And the team has already loved it. And so now I'm going, okay, what's the budget? Send me the budget. Send me the foreign sales estimates. Because usually at that point, they've brought on a foreign sales company and there's estimates and I can see how much that is and what that is up against the budget. Where are we looking to shoot it? What's the, what's, okay, it's going to be in Oklahoma. Is there 25% tax credit there? You know, I start looking at that. I'm trying to understand from a production how I can pull this off. What's the cast attached? When are they available? Oh, they're available in April and then they got to go back to Avatar. Oh, that's not going to work for us. We're never going to get ready by that time. You know, and that changes the whole game. So I call and I, pay, you know, that goes to another level of passing or not. Hey, if you guys are going to move this from April to June, I can think about coming in. Then I think about the financier side. Do we need equity? Am I raising that equity? Is the equity already there? Am I coming on as a creative producer only? And these are all the thoughts that are coming through my head in the moment. And then when the project elevates and we said, okay, it has everything we want, I would call up whoever sent it and start discussing the negotiations of us coming on as a production company and what that deal entails. And then from there, I start already thinking about uh, when this movie's made and it goes into post, what's the, the end game? Is it to go to a festival and be sold there? Or is it to get sold now to a Netflix, Amazon, Hulu and get them on board and then they pay you double the budget and then that's your back end and there's nothing else? Like these are the kinds of things that are happening. So let's say the, the movie is $2 million and you get to the point where you're going to like reach out to the writer of the script or whoever owns it and start that negotiation. Like, do you know where the money's coming from for this movie at that point? Or do you still have to find the money once you have the negotiation with the, the owner of the script? Sometimes I have to find the money. Sometimes I have some of the money. Sometimes I want to see where the process goes before I make the decision of whether we're putting the money in. Like Amasia has its own bevy of financiers. And in the case of uh, them that follow, uh, we kind of knew that we were going to be able to do that within house, right, financially. But there have been times where there's a project that came to me recently and I'm like, I love this creatively, but it'll never work for our financiers. And so we're going to come on as a creative producer and help bring the financing in from all of our sources and all of our connections. But it's not Amasia's financing. You know, you talk about mentorship, but it sounds like a lot of the projects that come to you are already really set from prestige and from experience and from connections. But it sounds like there is this kind of window of opportunity for the outside filmmaker to come in and work with you. Oh, absolutely. You Let me give you that answer. I'll give you two projects currently right now that came from the outside. One, we all as a team went to Comic-Con and my production exec like walked around found a random book, this would be considered random at a Comic-Con, um, called A Boy Like Me, um, which is a trans project written by a, a very great writer, Jenny Wood. And we knew nothing about it. Uh, he brought it home, read it, uh, liked it a lot. And uh, then we all read it. And then we started to think about who we would hire that would be the proper writer for this project. And then we hired a non-WGA writer to, to, to adapt the screenplay at the time. Or, um, and then we get the script you know, written and developed within house based off this book that we got the rights to because we met the author and built a relationship there. And so now we have this book, we have this screenplay, and it all came from a random walk down an aisle in Comic-Con. And uh, we're, we, we hired a director and we're, we're moving forward into like casting in that scenario. Then another scenario I got, we met with a writer through like a, a, you know, a connection where somebody said, hey, meet with this writer, uh, pitched us something, uh, there's, put together a treatment, read the treatment, loved it, uh, go out and write the script on spec. He went and wrote the script, script on spec. Then, then he actually came back to us in a bit of a bidding war with another company. We won out because we were there from the get-go and um, and it's this it's his first screenplay. You know what I mean? Like it's that's that's a one million dollar, one to two million dollar, you know, semi horror thriller script that just I'm very excited about. But th th I get that stuff all the time. You probably don't want to say like how much you paid for that script, but like do you can you just give us like the rough idea of like what that was to get that 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 script? So when it's written on script, I then just option it, right? So the numbers, the, but you know, the numbers on that are low. Um, 
uh, always option for very low because there's a lot of time, energy, and money spent in just making that project happen. And a lot of times the writers are very understanding of that. They're just, it's really exciting for them to be working with a really good team um, to go forward and, you know, get their movie made because it's their first foray out. But, you know, I'm not saying that particular script, but a lot of the scripts, you know, you know, I think we've paid options. I've never paid more than 10000 on an option of a script. Um, and most of them are five or less. Uh, they have extensions in them. So it's like, let's say I'm optioning a script for $1,500. And then in, you know, nine months, I give them another 1500 to extend it for another nine months, that kind of stuff. There's a bit of that. When we met at Napa, we talked a little bit about micro budget and how you came up in micro budget and both um, Ulrich and I are, you know, micro budget feature directors. Do you see any value in the micro budget feature these days? I mean, we made fun of Sundance in the 90s, but is there is there opportunity for micro budget filmmakers to really leverage their projects anymore? I mean, yes, of course I see the value in it. I mean, I got to say, I've probably watched, you know, maybe... 50 to 100 micro budget films a year just because that's the first uh, director reel I have, right? So somebody comes to me, they're like, he's attached or she's attached. And can I see their first film? And they give me their micro budget film. So I watch tons of those and it leads to me hiring that director um, because I now love their screenplay that they sent me or want to make this movie with them. And I have a record of like, I think, I think a lot of my films, maybe three or four of my films are first time directors. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not against that. So that's where there's benefit. I don't think you make a micro budget film and it becomes the next big Apple sensation or the next big Amazon Netflix thing. That's a little bit harder, but it can be a pitch to something greater. It could be pitched to a series. It just, people do so much better when they watch something visually than, than if you just have a script. So if you have a script in a short film, you have a script in a micro budget film, um, or your micro budget film is giving me an idea for a documentary. There's lots of value in just doing and moving forward and giving me opportunities. But like if you're saying micro budget film going and getting distributed and making its money back, I, I, don't, I deal with that less now. And you probably know more than me on this, Liz. And I felt like you did at the, at the, at the festival. But, um, but I think that that micro budget stuff is, is living on the Internet in, in kind of a significant way in in these different outlets for distribution on the internet that you can still make money off of. Um, and, but um, we watch everything. I mean, look, 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 like Quibi, yes, it's like they're spending billions to get like high-end content, but over time, Quibi's gonna just keep needing content and, uh, and they're gonna have to adjust their model along the way. And they may even have Quibi offshoots and Quibi micro budgets long form, you know? Like you don't know. And so I never think there's a negative to it. In these like a hundred or so micro budgets you're watching every year to like, you know, evaluate directors or whatever. Like what's a thing in a micro budget movie that like really, really impresses you and is like, okay, like, yeah, like I, I want to give this director a chance. Yeah. Okay. I, I, and I wouldn't say this is a micro budget, but it was a $500,000 budget. And um, maybe these days that's micro, but I've seen movies like the one that I saw. I'm trying to remember I'm trying not to mess this up, but it's Jennifer Reeder's first movie, and I ah, love... We interviewed just, her. We had her on the show love, recently. <laughs> okay, I love it. Knives and Skin, right? Love, 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 oh, love yeah. that film. And what I saw in that film was an incredible eye, a dramatic eye that was just not what I've seen a lot, right? The way the d- director of photography was, the way the shots were, the way the, the script was, the just the uniqueness. The I'm not saying I could make that film or ever greenlight that film. But I can say that's a creative director that I want to take and work with and find a way to get more commercial. Like when we worked with Brad Anderson on the call, he had done all these like very intense artistic movies like The Machinist. And you're like, well, that's not going to work for a widescreen release and bring in some real good commercial, um, you know, income that we're going to need. Right. Um, So if you take a director like Brad Anderson, you put him with a script like The Call, you're going to have gold, and that's exactly what happened. And we, I feel the same way about Jennifer Reeder. If we find the right script that she's willing to put her spin on that has a little bit more of a commercial aspect, she's going to, she's going to break big. And, uh, and, and so right now we are having multiple discussions with her on a couple of projects because I just see that as I, I, I think she's amazing. So and then on the other end, like what's a thing in a micro budget feature that will make you turn the movie off and be like, oh, this director's not ready yet. He they, they need some more time to get to get their chops up. Uh, you could just tell. I mean, we call them like film school, you know, films. You know, you you could just tell that 
it's not all there yet. They haven't come, they haven't come into themselves to pick a visionary style that's going to show me other than I know you can direct a film. Okay, so you know how to put the camera here, put the camera there, over the shoulder, over the shoulder. And you can, you can shoot the script, right? But, but what takes you above just shooting the script? If I can direct it as well as you can direct it, we're in trouble. I'm not a director <laughs> for a reason, right? And, and it's because I believe that I can just do the, what they call like the, you know, the journeyman, make it happen, do it, shoot the script. But how can you make it so that I, so it gets the attention of this incredibly talented, creative town we have that needs to get above the noise and make it be like, wow, did you see what they did with that? So it's a conversation piece at the table. And that's not going to happen if you're just shooting the script. You're putting out all these great big ideas out there and goals for yourself. Did you model any of this off of anyone else? I mean, did I have anybody in my past yeah, that like sort of Like a mentor, said, yeah. I, I mean, look, I have a mentor and he's my partner, but it's not from that perspe- perspective. He was, he's, his name is Michael Helfand. He's a fantastic human being and also a mentor to many, many, many big time successful heads of studios now. But, um, but I would say that the one thing that he taught me that I find really amazing is to be able to listen, to hear the other side, to know how to work together to create something great and and I have been blessed with him as my mentor but it wasn't from the indie side because he was always working at all the studios and he came over to indie so like he could learn from me and I was learning from him and that crossroad of what works commercially uh, and what what works in the indie world is in our partnership and uh, it's been very special but I you know I think a lot of what I had to do when I was younger and trying to figure it out was just watch all the same movies you watched and read all the same books you read, read and see how that was unique to me and how it would get my juices flowing and create my passion and my truth. So I want to dive into uh, them that follow really quickly just to hear a little bit more about that movie because not only is the trailer awesome, uh, I haven't seen the movie yet, but uh, the uh, the cast is amazing. And so... Like and then you also cited that that is one of your lower budget movies too, right? Is that what you said? Yes, it's it's probably it is my lowest budget movie, uh, other than my first <laughs> film. Other than my wow. first film, other than my first film in my in my real professional career. So how do you p- pull all those like big name actors together, like Walton Gog- Goggins, Olivia Coleman? Like how do you get like actors of that pedigree into a movie and then make it happen with a a, a, a tiny budget like that? Yeah, that's an amazing story, and I do have to say that one. It's also one of the big uh, kind of like nods to you can't do everything on your own, and so I had a producing partner on that who brought that to me, and she uh, was amazing. Her name is Danielle Robinson. She works for G Base, and uh, that's Gerard Butler's company. And Danielle Danielle Robinson was like a cast whiz. She knows exactly when cast members are going to break and has a real good eye for talent. Also, Orly Sidowitz, my casting director, uh, I've used on almost every one of my films now, is also an eye for talent. And so you rely on the people who are great at that to sort of give you the information. Then instinctually, it is my job to say, okay, let's push the button. I believe all of this information. I want these people. So Danielle, you know, was way ahead on how talented Olivia Coleman was out of the UK, way before The Crown, way before she even came close to the Oscar on The Favorite. Uh, Olivia came on to this project really early on. Uh, they had seen a movie called Tyrannosaurus and loved her, and the directors were all about her. And so that's, that was like the lucky moment for us in this movie. But um, the rest of the talent was just coming because that script was so good. The script was written by Brittany Poulton and Dan Savage. They were both first-time filmmakers coming out of the USC. Uh, they were in the producer's program, actually, the Peter Stark program. And uh, they had a couple of shorts. And I wasn't making the decision based on their shorts. I, the, them in the room, uh, uh, when they were pitching me this, and that script that they wrote, plus Danielle Robinson, um, and just sort of the, the aura of this could be a family film. When I say family, I mean a family-oriented crew and cast coming together to make this movie uh, great. And, you know, if you notice, Alice Englert, who's, who's sort of like, almost like introducing Alice Englert, she's the star of the film, and she's, she crushes that role. Uh, and I think will become a very big star because of it. But, I mean, Walton Goggins is the preacher. 
pr pretty much should have won, or at least been nominated for an Oscar. I mean, he did a great job with that. Olivia Coleman, amazing. Lewis Pullman, Bill Pullman's son. Awesome, dude. My, one of my, he's like one of my closest, like we talk all the time now. I'm like friends with him because we, he's just such a, such a great soul and was, he just did a great job for us and he supported this whole film. So it's like that. Wow. So basically a great script, uh, pit, like partnered with like a really great producing partner who kind of helped like you guys really bring this thing together, basically. Yeah. I, it's, it, it's hard for you when you're saying when you name, name all those names and about, you know, three years ago or two years ago, you, you're not thinking this is going to work, but you have to, you have to believe in your partners a bit. And you, you know, you watch the, the movies and the television shows that all of these actors are in and you see the talent, you see how they can play the role and you see their passion. Caitlin, Caitlin Deaver's in the movie. I mean, Caitlin Deaver now is a superstar. You know, it's, it, it's just a lot of that stuff, um, you know, just kind of comes organically as you're building up. And of course, the agencies start to support you because they start to see how great the script is and the filmmakers and they see we're supporting them. It's, it's a lot of that over time. Did the actors ever, did they seem resentful? Did they ever show any sort of frustration or resentment towards the budget? Or was it always them understanding that there were restrictions? Uh, day one, day one, making this movie for peanuts, you're not getting paid. I mean, look, Jim Gaffigan uh, can, can get, on, you know, get on a private plane and go all around the world. He's one of the biggest comedians on the planet. You know, he's not doing this because of the money. Um, you know, he, he was amazing in his role. So I, I just knew, they all knew up front. We were very clear with them, with their reps, and they were very clear with us, we want to do this part. We want to make this movie. And so when we're all sitting in a Holiday Inn Express in Boardman, Ohio, I may have said that name wrong, but I think I got it right. Um, you know, that's, we're all in there. Cast, crew, producers, writers, directors, you know, top of the line Below the line, production assistants, all in the same hotel. And what size crew do you have on a movie like that with those kinds of actors and that small of a budget? It's not huge. You know, it ranges depending on the day and the situations, whether there's a stunt or not, between like 30 and 55 or something like that, I think. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not huge at all. Uh, but uh, we we had a great team. We got a great uh, director of photography. Uh, Brett Jukowicz was unbelievable. And he brought his team from New York and... We had a, it was a non-union shoot um, in really deep, deep, deep Ohio. You couldn't find us if you tried. Uh, and, um, and we had an amazing opportunity from a town called Youngstown where they gave us uh, the ability to uh, access one of their economic development loans. Uh, and we backed that with our personal guarantees uh, from our investors. And it, you know, it, it, it took a village to make this movie and it also included an actual village. And was that on the 25 day side of things or more on the 35 day uh, side of things? I, I don't have it exactly in front of me, but it's 25 or under. It may have been 23. Arik, I want to ask the personal question now. I want to, I want to do it, deviate. do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay. Um, and Bradley, we could cut this out if you want, but um, you have a big announcement in your life. You have a big change in your life coming. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to balance this new edition, possibly? I have no idea, because if anybody pretends like they know, they're lying. I mean, it's my first child. I, my, my wife is pregnant. She's four months pregnant. Um, Congratulations. You know, thank you. We got married less than a year ago uh, in Italy. So very special, very exciting. We got a puppy right before coronavirus hit. So between a puppy, a baby, a marriage... Um, and you know, me trying to pull together Green Hornet and this new movie, Wild Mountain Time, that's coming out, by the way, Emily Blunt, John Hamm, I got to throw in the plug, Christopher Walken and Jamie Dornan. It's going to be awesome. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on in my life. And the good news is I have a very resourceful wife. Uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, we will find a balance together on taking care and me making sure my hours are right, but it is not easy. It won't be easy. And I think we'll have some stressful moments, but it's part of the filmmaker's life if, you know, you have to figure this out. There are some great things about being a filmmaker where you can be like, oh, I'm not working for two months. And there are some great, uh, you know, and then that's also a stress because you're not working for two months. But in the case of me who owns a company, it's kind of like a regular job. So I go into work every single day. And then, of course, when we're going to make the films, I'm away and in that place. I believe we're going to, she's going to come and so is the, the baby to those locations until school age. And that's where the challenge will become very difficult. Well, that begets a 
does it begat? Is that the right verb? Um, yes. That inspires another question, which is like right now, what is your balance? Like, are you able to turn off like, or are you always on receiving emails, commenting, um, supporting projects? I, I'm always on and it's probably not good and not healthy. And I've aged myself in that process. I'm just being totally honest with you. You know, there is no magical at six o'clock. I shut off my phone. I don't think we would have gotten our Green Hornet deal done if I did that. So there are things that I don't do great. But what I do do is on the weekends, um, my partner's better than me at this. And it may be because he does this that I'm able to do this. But on Friday nights to Saturday nights total, my partner shuts off his whole world because um, he's, you know, he's religious, he's Jewish, and he follows Shabbat. And so I sort of get that quiet time as well because if he's not working, I'm not working, and we're sort of off, if that makes sense. And then Sundays, they're very much Italian. I'm an Italian, like the Italian way of just like doing nothing. So I find Sunday to be a, a mix between reading scripts and doing nothing. Um, no, when I say do nothing, I mean like working out and trying to keep your, you know, going for a walk and watching some shows and being with your wife. Um, so I try on the weekends. The weeks are forget it, forget it. They're just, just not. Do you ever out. turn off your phone uh, on the weekends at all? Is that something that you try to do or is that just too much? I think it's pretty much away from me. It's not off, but it's not, the ringer's not on and the, uh, I don't check it constantly and I, I'm a little bit away from it. I need to get a lot better at it. I really do. And coronavirus has really <laughs> helped that um, <laughs> right. because, you know, you're working at home now and spending more time with my family. And then at the same time, I'm also able to sort of just do this with you guys and then take off for an hour and go get something to eat and relax. It's not like I'm in the office going boom, 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 boom. But what is the most challenging aspect of all this for you? Is, is it the deal making stuff? Is it being on set and managing a crew or helping to manage a crew? Like what's the most challenging aspect of filmmaking uh, from, from your perspective? If you're a filmmaker and or a producer, you hate being in the office. You hate uh, not being on set making projects. So the most difficult thing I know, I say it almost daily, is that I'm not in production. It's, it, that's the kind of addiction you need in this business. And maybe passion is a better word than addiction. But I feel very much me when I'm in production. And I hate not being in production. So the balance of like, when you say the deal making and the pre-production, like all the things you got to do to get the project to go, I'm doing it. But it's not my favorite part of the process. Because I just want to be making the movie. And that's a good insight into a personality of a filmmaker. I, I think the, the, I mean, when I meet with directors, it's all about like, here's what we're doing. We got this plan. We got this. We got this. We got this. I, uh, we can go in February. We can go now. You know, like they <laughs> want to get into production. Right. And, they don't, and, and, and my balance sometimes is like, I'm loving that energy because I want to do that too. But there's a lot of times where I have to say to them, hey, I get it. We can't just go with this random actor. You know, it's like, well, what do you mean? We're just going to go? I thought we had uh, XXX attached. And then those people that you had attached were the reason we were able to finance the film. <laughs> I'm sorry right. she dro she dropped out, but like we're not just going to, no, no, but he's great. She's great. Let's go. And it's like <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of that like managing artists. I always say that I'm the bridge between art and commerce because you have to have that bridge to sustain it. Even if you were just making a painting, somebody has to commission the painting, right? So there's this bridge between the money side of it and the business side of it and the artist side of it. So I deal with that energy. I, I, I manage that energy. Okay, well, let's take commerce out of it for just one second. Sure. What would be the project you would want to put out into the world, regardless of how it's received, regardless of how much money comes in? What's like that film you want to make? Well, there's two or three of mindsets of that. I can't give you a particular one, but what I can say is something that has a massive social impact would be awesome, you know, where I feel like I'm affecting change. It never... Uh, I never lost it when Robin Williams had said one point where he walked down the street and the and the movie that most people came up to him and said that changed my life was Dead Poets Society because of Carpe Diem and whatever it was about that film it mattered and it, it was the, he the, he did Mrs Doubtfire he did all these nobody came up they always said that I want people to come up to me and say that movie affected change for me or the world and so until I've made that movie. I'm not going to stop. That's what matters to me from, from that perspective. And then the other perspective is, like a Jennifer Reader, an extremely offbeat, completely creative-driven film that has nothing to do with making money but is all about the creative energy that can also maybe 
uh, affect some change would be awesome as well. And, and, and I, I don't get to do either of them, which is probably why I want to do them. <laughs> And why don't you get to do those kinds of movies? Do you think it's just because it's for not... the reason they don't the, make for money? The, yeah, okay, for the reasons right. that she's saying. Like <laughs> I did, I kind of did it with them that follow. It didn't. Re- it wasn't a commercial movie at all. It wasn't meant to be like a huge money maker. My goal there was to make sure we got our investors their money back. Uh, we had, we did make a little bit of money on it, so that was good. Uh, and everybody in the in the in the uh, is getting some money on the back end, so that's amazing. And that doesn't happen all the time. I get scripts a lot of times, and and, and I feel like they're pushing the boundaries in ways I'd love to go, but I don't have the time to spend on it because I know the budget's going to be low. We're not going to make any money, and I just it isn't strong enough in this moment for me to take that risk. What size budget does a film have to be in order for it to be like a lucrative proposition for you and your company? Oh, you mean from like okay, that's a good question. There's two ways to think of that. You know, the low, low budget sometimes could be very lucrative if it's going to take off, if it's commercial, like these horror films, like Saw was made for a million dollars and did 150 million worldwide. You know, that's a significant, like that's probably made more money for that producer than any big budget movie did. You know what I mean? But then if you do it the other way, you want your budget to be probably at this stage in my life, the budget probably needs to be uh, 12 million or more. So you can get like a decent producer fee of like, I don't know, one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars or a little bit more. That that's like the my. And remember, you're working on that for three years. So that's like fifty thousand right. a year, right? right. <laughs> I'm saying that having made no movies above that budget level, other than the call. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so uh, a lot of times you're squeezing on these five, three to five million dollar movies and trying to trying to get like a, a, a you know a fee of some sort on the front end to hold you while you're waiting for that back end. I mean, us producers, you know, the old school mindset was that we made tons of money. That's not true anymore. That's been gone for a while. That's been gone most of my career. What advice would you have to like young directors or not even young, but just like new directors who are trying to get their films made? Like they have their first script or their second script and they're trying to raise the money and get the film made. Like what advice do you have to to that person? (sighs) Oh, my God. I mean, if it was a one word answer, it's perseverance. I couldn't believe some some of these projects 12 years before they get made um so there's that but i think the biggest piece of advice is 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 if you're hearing the same thing from everywhere you go you know you might want to get off it i don't know how you know get off it is or or listen to it because a lot of times they they feel very strongly about their thing and then they're hearing every time not, not necessarily like pass 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 but it's like change this scene at the end it's not working and you hear it 15 times from 15 well-established people in the industry, you probably need to change it. You know what I mean? It's it, it, right. it, it, it's really a problem. I've been working on a movie where uh, the director is very strong in his vision and he's and he's he's amazing at it. Um, and he's 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 let the producers uh, look at the film and you know make their make their points. And he's uh, he loved what we had to say and he took that in and 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 he's crafting from there. And I think that is. The sign of a great director when you can when you can take you know make sure your vision is the vision but when you can take some of the little pieces around and listen and 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 incorporate that and be collaborative uh, you're you're in a good place because i'll tell you i have been to q and a's at festivals and listened to directors speak and just from the q and a i will never work with that director and i haven't <laughs> i haven't read a script i haven't read a thing i haven't i just saw the q and a and i'm out let, let, you have to tell us, like, what would be a thing that a director would say in a Q&A that would make you feel like I, you're I can I can tell that the attitude and the mindset of that director is not collaborative. You can tell if you're good. Right. Right. And and it's just the way that questions are answered, the way stories are told, the way their, their energy comes off, the way they feel, the way they talk down to people, the way the chip's shoulder might be. I'm uh, like, that ship, that ship is in a Q&A at Sundance? Oh man! Can you imagine on a <laughs> set? Right. You, it's you're, you're, you have no threat to you. You're at Sundance. You're at Toronto. You're doing a Q and A, and everybody loves your film. And the chips there? No, no. 
That's funny. <laughs> wow. And not to make excuses for them, but I mean, it's because directors have been uh, weirdly worshipped or some directors have been worshipped and then like estranged and thought of as these like mystical figures and then they get away with murder. And so like that bad behavior gets reinforced regularly in the culture. So shame on them. Yeah, no, I hear you. And and look, there are great people who, there, sorry, there are, there are tough directors who are amazing at Q&As. And then you realize they're, you know, later they're in, they could be really, really tough. Right. But they're great. And they can, pl- and they, they can sort of weed through um, how to do that. You know, you have to look at somebody and say, I want to be with you for three years. You are going to be eating, sleeping, drinking, sitting next to, like, sharing blankets. That's how I think, right? Like, that's what I'm doing for right. three years. So do I want you in my life? Do I want to go to dinner and bring my 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 wife to that dinner you know like that's there is a bit of that and yeah you could be eclectic and cool and artistic and wacky and have all kinds of fight in you i'm okay with fight that's not the point there's a general sense of love and passion that i'll that i'll take any day of the week but i'm not taking you know anger and defeat and 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 orneriness and I don't know how to explain it, but when I feel assholes. it, I'm like, I'm You don't out. want assholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want assholes. But, you know, unless your assholeness is what makes you great and isn't directed at the people trying to help you, but maybe it's directed at the film itself or the writing or the process or the pulling out your hair to make this happen, that's okay. But don't treat people that way. You know, that's that's different. Um, I think we have to end on that just because it's such a nice way to end this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you already talked about this, but I'm going to maybe have something else to add. The first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? But let's no jokes. You say you don't think anyone should see it. But what you know, tell us something you love about about Magic Rock. Well, you know, I, I, I do love is that it may never happen again that I was a part of the entire process that I wrote, directed, produced and starred in the film. And then I had to figure out how to do all those things, having no education on any of them. Um, that was an amazing thing. And it's a very personal film to me because I went to a summer camp for a very long time. So it was very personal and I was involved in the whole process. And it's when I was young and when I was starting out and I was making decisions like anamorphic lenses when you really don't need them. And, and, and just, it's just funny, you know, it's funny, it's cute, it's timely, it's nostalgic for me. Uh, to watch that film and I, there is a special place in my heart for everybody that was involved in that film and I still talk to the cinematographer and editor today um, and so I, I yeah I get it and uh, but you know I would tell nobody to see it and I'm embarrassed by you know my my uh, noviceness but you know it's not a bad thing what's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received the the best that I've learned is is to keep your ego in check and it's so hard because there's a balance between confidence and ego that you use. And there's a lot of I, 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 I. And you really aren't an I situation. You are a we situation. And if you can stay we as you get more and more successful, uh, you will last a lot longer. How do you know you've made it and you've broken through and you've secured this producerial career that you have been been after all these years? You don't. I, I, I just had a conversation with an intern that's coming on. And I was saying to her, I go, I still don't think that I've made it, but you may think I have. And Neil Moritz may be like, yeah, good luck, right? Like, it's like, I feel like I'm always striving to make it and haven't really made it. I don't know what that is. And I think that that drive is that if I thought I made it or that I, that I am a producer and I am making <laughs> things happen, um, I think I'd be like, yeah, you know, let's go on some vacation. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's something about this business that makes you feel like you got to keep going. Uh, and I don't, I don't ever feel like I've gotten that career, but I, but I hear what you're saying. And, and there are times where I look back and like, oh, wow, I made X amount of movies and I'm working for myself and I own my own company. There are those times, but a lot of the times that I feel like my career is good is when I'm standing on the set and we're making the film and everybody's smiling and everybody, you know, is very excited about this project and that they're brief moments as opposed to the whole career. If you could go back in time, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? Wow. You know what I would do that's going to sound so ridiculous? I would have went and started working in the companies earlier. I always been on the indie side all the way through my career. But if I started over again, I would want to go into the companies. And here's the very big reason why. There are so many people who have an advantage over me 
because they started in LA at 18. They worked within their those companies, like they worked for CAA and they worked for Universal and they worked for these cool little, you know, big production companies or legendaries or whatever it is. And they start to build a massive network of people young, you know, when they're twenties or whatever it is. And then those people start to go to other companies and now they know all these people at all of these companies in their forties that I had to build over the last 10 years and I'm still not there. And they have these long, long, long term relationships within all of the companies. And that makes this business work. It's all about the relationships. You've heard it a thousand times. So if I went back, I would have taken that like low level job at that, you know, at like focus features in New York and then like built myself up there, then moved to L.A. and worked in like an agency and then went from there and worked in like a production company. Like I just think that I needed the network earlier. I would have moved earlier. I would I lived in New York and I would have moved to L.A. earlier. At least that, at least starting that, you know, sooner would have been better. But anyway, go ahead. No, I mean, our last question is just like the button, which is like, do you think making movies is hard? Making movies is extremely hard. And there are a lot of jobs that you can do that are easier that pay a ton more money. Um, But I think it is worth it when you've fully completed whatever that goal in filmmaking is for you. Um, You definitely get to look back and have that sort of poster on the wall and go, wow, I did that. I could technically walk away from the industry today and say that I was a producer of films and felt good about it. But I just I, I just know that it would be nagging me that I didn't keep going and keep accomplishing more stories that I wanted to tell and make a bigger difference, which was the reason I set into this in the first place was to make a difference. And I haven't felt like I've done that yet. That's amazing, Bradley. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Where should people go if they want to find out more about you? I have. I'm very, very excited about my social media channels. I have uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and they're all at Bradley Gallo. Um, so it's really easy. And then, of course, uh, the, I think I have a personal website. I think Amasia has a website. I'm sure I'm on IMDb. So you can find me in all kinds of ways. And I, I pretty much answer almost everyone if I can. Wow. Thanks again. Bradley, really cool. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and thanks to Bradley Gallo for being on the show. What a fun, amazing conversation. And I really, truly can't wait to see what he does with the Green Hornet. You can check out our website at makingmoviesishard.com where you can find the thing, links to the things we talked about on this episode, including trailers for all of Bradley, Bradley's films. I'm going to throw them all on there. If you want to get in contact with us, you can send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com or find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at MMIH Podcast. Our Facebook and Instagram are getting a lot of love these days, which is great thank you all for liking us and following us on facebook and instagram um this has nothing to do with liz or i uh, it's our wonderful partners our producers They're thank amazing. you so much you guys are rad we love oh, you yeah so so great um and if you want to follow me i'm all be on twitter and instagram liz where are you mainly on twitter at liz Mana show and if you like the show, tell a friend, help us get the word out. You can always leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or wherever else we are. And finally, and not leastly at all, uh, thanks to our producers, Greg Holdsman and Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Allison Stoney, and the whole Bloodstream Media team for making this episode happen and just for, you know, pumping us up, getting us out there, you know? Um, this has it's been great. Like... We're, we're, we're almost at uh, 2,000 likes on Facebook, I think. We're like, what? Like what we're, stream? You're the best. Like, I think 1,500, which to me is like close round to up 2,000. Five round, round up, round up to, to 2,000. <laughs> Basically, I think by the time this episode comes out, we'll be at 2,000. Because Wait, this is you're like, selling ourselves short. We'll be at five, five million. Five million. <laughs> so I was going to say, like, help us get to 3,000 because, okay, sure. you know, we'll already be at 2,000 by now, obviously, at the rate that we're growing. So help us get to three. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thanks, guys. Talk to you next week. So yeah. Yeah, so so, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I...